I forgot the blank slide between the song and the video, didn't I? <laughs> okay, now you know I'm not perfect. I now made my one mistake for the year. That's awesome. I got it over, well, I made it all a long way into the year. All right, so uh, that was, you're probably wondering, how many of these Fantastic Four cartoons were there? There were four. Isn't that kind of cool? Four sermons, four characters, four stories, and, well, um, four introductions to four different cartoons. So now you know, oh, there's got to be one more. Yeah, there is. Uh, we are going to continue on this little series that we call the Fantastic Foundations of Faith. And I want to introduce you to number five today. Um, see, in the little thing that went up, the rocket ship that went up and exposed the Fantastic Four to these cosmic radiations that gave them all these wonderful powers, there were not four people in that rocket ship. Did you know how many there were actually five? The fifth one, his name is Victor Von Doom. Only problem is he didn't come back a hero. He is actually the Fantastic Four's um, main villain. And he is a former scientist and a colleague of Reed Richards, who is Mr. Fantastic. And, well, Victor Von Doom has genius levels of intellect. And his powers, you think the Fantastic Four got a good dose? His powers revolve around sorcery, and yes, he is very powerful. He is capable of absorbing energy and then reprojecting it, manipulating electricity, creating protective shields, he can do dimensional travel, so he can travel between universes. He can even heal himself. He can control the weather by creating blizzards. And he can even transfer his consciousness to another by just looking them into the eye. Man, wouldn't that be a cool power? Wouldn't you just like to be able to control somebody's mind? Parents are like, I'd like to have that one. Bring my kids on. I can just look them in the eye and they'll do exactly what I say. Okay, some kids do that anyway. Um, but Doom was not the hero, he was the villain, and he would have been the ultimate villain, except for he had one teeny, tiny, little weakness in all of his powers. It was his arrogance. Victor Von Doom was an extremely arrogant individual. Now, this sermon is not going to use Doom as its background. It's actually going to focus on good old Mr. Fantastic. This is Reed Richards. This is going to be his particular story. And remember, as we arrive in th week three, um, we're studying these four fantastic foundations. And when we look at Reed Richards and we look at Victor Von Doom, they have a lot of things in common. Um, they were both insatiably curious. You have to be that to be a scientist. You can't have no curiosity and be a scientist because then you never go looking for more. And, well, both of them had endless drive. Um, both of them just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Both of them were extremely ambitious. Both of them wanted to see success, and they were originally looking for accolades in the scientific community. And guess what? Both of them, well, they both were a little bit on the arrogant side. As a matter of fact, that arrogance is what drove Richards to become the leader of the Fantastic Four because he always blamed himself for what happened. Let me leave you a little snippet from his bio. When the government cut Richards' funding, it always starts with money, doesn't it? To the starship, the relentless genius gathered Grimm, Sue Storm, her brother Johnny, and Victor Von Doom for an illicit test of the flight of the craft. Unfortunately, he failed to figure out the proper shielding and to repel the cosmic rays while in space, and the five of them were bombarded by, these unique, by this unique radiation. The ship crash-landed back on Earth with Richards and the others discovering they had been mutated by these rays. Altered by the ray, Reed Richards' entire body can now stretch and expand in multiple ways. As well as condense and compact, compact, he may form various shapes with it, as well as become ultra thin, I like that power, um, and ultra dense. The latter helping him to use his fist, for example, as a battering ram and, and the like. On some occasion, Rich has, Richards has contained explosives into his body by stretching over and around them, altering the features. He can alter his features to disguise himself, and all of his features can be created and stretched. So even he can make his ears bigger or whatever. So, so he's got this wonderful ability 
that he can stretch. And he is the um, leader of the Fantastic Four. And of course, the difference between him and Doom was the fact that leadership sought to do what was best for the team. Doom, the villain, who also was a dictator, decided he was going to do what was best for him. It's a subtle difference between leadership and dictatorship. Dictatorship, you're only interested in what's good for you. Leadership, you're interested in what's good for the people that you're trying to lead. So this is also just not about the Fantastic Four. We're not here to just teach you a lesson on superheroes. The superheroes are just the backdrop for looking at these wonderful four foundations found right at the end of the the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, and there are four characters, and guess what? There are four stories that go with these characters, with these, with these ideas. And remember, we've already taken a look at the first two. Um, first one that we looked at is living faith begins with a rock-solid foundation. And we had the sand and the rock and all the different object lessons that were up here. And we talked about if we're going to actually have our living faith that we've been looking for all year, we're going to really have to build it on a solid foundation that's focused on Jesus, that takes into, that takes into consideration God's Word, both the Old and New Testament, and one that binds us together as a body of believers. And then last week, uh, we discussed my favorite character, the Human Torch, and we talked about the idea how living faith must develop a faith passion for Jesus. And that faith passion isn't just me saying, woohoo, and doing Jesus chants. That faith passion is about me having a desire to be productive for his kingdom. And that's the passion. The passion has to come out in the idea that I want to produce. And, and we had the fire and the branches and the living plant. Is it still living, Amber? Amber took it home where it's still living. It's made it longer than it would make it my house. Okay. So we had the plant. We have all those pieces and parts. And, and we discovered that we have to understand the difference between the living and the dead. And the truth is, the only thing that's living is that which produces. And so now we're going to move on to um, number four. And number four is really, it's all about Reed Richards. Um, I got a couple things in my box I want to look at this morning before I, I tell you what the, the plan is this morning. So it's all about Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. And the first thing I got in my faith box this morning is a magnifying glass. So I want to ask you something. You know if I ask you something, it's got to be a trick question, right? Um, when I look through a magnifying glass... Do I see more or less? Yes. Huh? Yes. Ah, Lauren's got the right answer. The correct answer is yes. I see less of the things around me, but more of the things I focus on. Ooh, that sounds like an interesting principle. And then I have something else in my box this morning in honor of Mr. Fantastic, Mr. Super Stretchy. I have a box of rubber bands. I love, my son is like cowering behind, he, he's like, <laughs> he's like, dad and rubber bands doesn't end well. Because um, I, if you've been in youth ministry in long ago, you know these are very valuable tools. Because you can wrap them around things to hold them together. You can take these things and you can shoot them back there. And you can make these things go a long way. You can have rubber band wars. Everybody's now, I got a whole box of these things today. <laughs> Today is not the day to go sleep in church, okay? Just so you know, I'm, I'm armed and ready. And you know what else I can do with these wonderful things? I can take, oh, somebody's shooting back. That's got to be Nancy. So I can take these things, if I do it with one at a time, and I take these and I grab their sides and I pull them together. I can take my super stretchy rubber bands and I can make them even more super stretchy and I can, add, and I can create something that's wonderfully super stretchy. So I have rubber bands, and I have a magnifying glass, and you're probably asking yourself, what on earth does that have to do with living faith, and where do I find this in the Bible? Well, here's what you need to understand. If you're going to have living faith, you must, it, must be it must be developing, but it must be focused. But at the same time, it has to be stretchy. Now, I use those two words, and you're probably thinking, I'm buried. Those two words don't go together. Trust me. I have a plan. I came here this morning with a plan, and so you need to understand, I've got to have both. I've got to be focused, and at the same time, I've got to be stretchy. I have more weapons than you, Nancy. 
<laughs> okay, but the story that we're going to associate with this morning is actually found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? And in your name did we not provide mir- perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you, from me, you evildoers. And I begin to read this. You're probably thinking, okay, Barry, you're stretching this a bit to make this. It's not a stretch. Although I'm going to teach you how to be a little stretchy today. Um, the idea here is that we are now in a, a story as Jesus is lining up his sermon. He's definitely going to what we call the end times. He's talking about that moment when people, us, Time has gone. There are no clocks. There are no calendars. We're not worried about day and night anymore. We're now standing before God, and we're given an account of our life. We're, we're looking out there, and, and you know what? We're going to have to lay out our spiritual resume. Don't we want to do this, right? And, and these people, they, they have quite an impressive resume, do they not? I mean, this is a very ambitious res- um, resume they've got. They said, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not go out and proclaim in your name Jesus? Did we not talk about Jesus? Um, look, in your name, we drove out demons. I don't have that on my resume, okay? I don't, I, I've never, okay, I'd be, I'm thankful. I don't think I've ever encountered a demon, let alone try to drive him out. Um, some people might say that I am. No, not that. Okay, but, but I've never done this before, but they've got this on their resume. And they said, we perform miracles in your name, Jesus. Look at all that we've done for your kingdom. Surely you can see our solid foundation and our passion for you. Sure. But here's the thing. Remember, these four pieces, they form the four foundations that come together. You ever tried to build something on three corners? Doesn't work very well, does it? You got to put one in the middle and then it doesn't work as well. You, you, you need the four corners. And so these are four corners of our faith. And so you've got to have this one that goes with it because here's what I don't want you to lose sight of. Jesus says many are going to try it this way. Not a few, not some, not a couple, not one. It says that many, they are banking on the idea that the day comes and I've got to stand before Jesus and give an account of my life. I am going to impress Jesus with all the good things that I've done. I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to be like the used car salesman and say, don't you want to buy this, Jesus? Look at all the wonderful features it has on it. And I am going to somehow convince Jesus I'm good enough to come in. He's going to be so impressed with how well I preach sermons. He's going to so like my sermons that he's going to let me in just so I can come in and preach to him. Um, He's going to so impressed with my music, he's going to come in so he can hear me sing in person. He's so impressed with how well I I cook, surely he wants me to come in and cook. All these things that we do that we think impress God, sometimes we try to use them as how God is going to relate to God. And this says many are going to try this. Many. And as I look around this morning, there are people sitting here in the building, and there are people online, and I wonder how many of us, this is our plan. I'm planning on, at the end of the day, is to impress Jesus with how much I've done. But Jesus gives them a very dramatic response. He looks at these people, and he says to them, and it says plainly, he didn't mince words. He said, get out of here. Go away. You know Why? You're not coming in my house by what you did. I don't know who you are. Man, that's got to be a hard statement to hear come at you. Who are you? Are are you like the used car salesman? Are you like selling Girl Scout cookies? You showed up my door and saying how great you are. Who are you? I don't know you. I'm not going to let you in my house. I'm not going to let you into my kingdom because we have no relationship. You see... That's what these people did. Their faith never focused on the relationship. Look at the words that they're using. Look at all I did. Look at all I am capable of. 
Look at our, all I accomplished. And yeah, I did it all in your name, Jesus, but it never says that I did it for you. I just kind of used you as my calling card as the reason I'm doing it. They never had a relationship whatsoever. This is kind of the mistake the church at Ephesus made. They just had a bunch of things that they did, and there was no relationship behind it at all. They had no heart. And here's the other part. Um, they never stretched their faith beyond themselves. They counted on the fact that I am doing enough of this, and I'm doing enough things, and I've done enough, that their faith was not like one of these rubber bands. It wasn't very stretchy because it was absorbed into themselves. See, they never, info, they never focused and they never stressed, stretched. They were doing all that they were doing to earn merit with God. Think about that for a second. They were doing what they were doing to earn merit with God. So they were treating their religion, they were treating their relationship like a job. You know how jobs work, right? I have a job that's not here at the church. It's with another company. And here's the deal. I go to the job, and I spend a certain number of hours at the job, and I do a certain number of things at the job. And at the end of the job, and the end of the, and a certain number, guess what they do? They pay me. And guess what? I, I, I don't mind telling you, it's the moment they stop paying me, guess what? I'm not going back to work for them. Because I am doing that job to earn a paycheck. And these people were doing the same thing. They were doing their job not because they loved the person that they were doing it for. They were doing their job because they wanted to get paid at the end of their life. And it says many do this. Um, they created their own plan of salvation. Did you catch that? They, they, they said, look, I know what you did on the cross, Jesus, and I know that, that you took nails and they whipped you and they beat you and they stuck you in a tomb and they did all these things to you. But don't you know, you missed it. There was a much easier way to do this, Jesus. You could have sat on your, sat on your throne and looked down and just given me a bunch of good works to do and I could have done them all and you could say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and I get to come into the kingdom. And don't you know, you wasted your time, Jesus. There was a much easier way to do this. Just let me earn it. Isn't that what they're telling the king of kings? I get to come in because of all the things I did, not because of the relationship I had. Jesus, you wasted your time. You see, they decided the standard. They said, well, okay, this many hours of prophesy gets me maybe a small apartment in heaven. But if I add in a few miracles and I go from, a, from, a, from an apartment to maybe a ranch, and if I add in a few demon drive outs and I get to go from the ranch to maybe a mansion, they had set some kind of a standard. And in the process of all of this, um, they placed more value on what they wanted, not what God asked them to do. You notice in all of these things that they said that they did, they never mentioned anybody that actually had their life changed because of it. They missed it. Um, they weren't out there trying to do it for people. They were out there doing it because they wanted to show. And then here's the big thing. In the process, they totally discounted that sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. They totally blew him off. It's not important. I got a better way to do this and an easier way to do this and a more comfortable way to do this. And I have a word for this. Folks, this is tragic. But it says many will do this. Many will do this. And here's the question I have for you today. Are you amongst the many? Is this the way that you're setting up your retirement plan in heaven? You're going to earn your spot by doing enough to get there. And then cash it all in at the end and you're going to be impressed. Impressed to Jesus when you get there. Now, I want to switch gears for a moment because I do want to talk about identifying the stretchy faith and focused faith that we're looking for. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This brings up a good question. What's the will of the Lord? Here it is. I know people hate this slide sometimes. You're like, we've seen that. Yeah, you've seen this about four times this year, and you might continue to see it because this is God's will for your life. I'm going to boil it down for you. God's will for your life. Establish your relationship with Jesus. 
Help others establish their relationship with Jesus. That's it. Well, who do you want me to marry? You know what? I don't think there's like this magic path. Establish your relationship with Jesus, and then whoever you marry, make sure they also are established with Jesus, and then guess what? Make sure that you both commit your lives to leading others to Christ, whether that be your kids or whatever. Where am I supposed to work? You know what? We'll figure it out. Establish your relationship with Jesus, commit your life to the leading people to Christ. We'll figure all the rest of it out. This is the will of God. And they lost the focus on this. This is what they failed to see. So I want to flip over just a little bit in Matthew. Um, this is Matthew chapter 25. And I know you're worried. You're saying, that's 46 verses. Surely you're not going to do a verse-by-verse sermon of the No. Okay? But I do want to take these three little stories. And there are three parables. And just so you know, we usually preach them as three sermons. You do get, Jesus was a long-winded preacher. This is one lesson that he taught. It's one lesson with three points. And so I really want to kind of run through these three stories that we find in Matthew 25, and then we're going to make some applications. And why, am I, why did I pick here? Because when you come to Matthew chapter 25, um, they are absolutely, positively um, end-time parables. We are, we are at that moment in time when Jesus is, has returned, and so he tells us these three stories, and these three stories, well, um, they all had something in common. So, so here are your commonalities. All three of these stories had a returning party. One story, the, the ten virgins had a groom. The one that had the bags of gold had a master. And the one that, that, that came at the end, they had a king. Each had multiple people that were waiting for the return. As the story goes, um, the ten virgins had, had ten virgins. And uh, the bags of gold had those three servants. And, well, the, um, the last one, the, the sheep and goats, they had the sheep and goats. And they were awaiting for the return. And here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Each had those that were accepted. Now, Pay attention to that sentence because it's important. I'm not saying that each of them had people that accepted. Each of them had things and had people. Each of them had people or parties that were accepted from the story. In the story of the ten virgins, five were accepted, five were not. In the story of the bags of gold, the, the servants, two were accepted, one was not. In the in the story of the of the of the, the, the sheep and goats, the sheep were accepted and the goats were not. And that's the other thing that you have in common because each had those that were not accepted. Now, this is important because somehow we got the idea that everybody is accepted. It doesn't matter really how I do on the life. As long as the minister at the end of my life can come up with the nice things to say at my funeral, then obviously he can preach me into heaven. I hate to tell you this. If you're putting your faith in that, I am a lousy preacher when it comes to funerals. Okay, I don't preach anybody into heaven. I might preach a nice funeral, but I can't preach anybody into heaven. I can't do it. You know why? Because I can't impress God either. And so we need to realize that that there is something here that made some accepted and some not. And now I'm real interested because guess which party I want to be in? I want to be in the accepted party, not in the one that gets turned away. I want to be the one that he says, come on in and find your place of rest, not depart from me because I don't know who you are. So I think this morning that maybe we better take a quick look at these three little stories and decide for ourselves absolutely, positively, what is God looking for? Because it's all about focused and stretchy faith. It's all about zeroing in on the things that you should and taking out the things around it and looking for the details. And at the same time, it's all about being able to stretch your life so that you can go out. I didn't shoot that toward anybody. I know better. Okay. Although I could. That would be kind of fun. So let, let's talk about this focused and stretchy faith and let's take a look at these, these three little parables that Jesus told. And here's the first principle that I want want you to see. To focus your attention, you have to stretch your preparedness. Remember the story of the ten virgins? 
They came out there and they were all ready and they were waiting for the bridegroom and they had all had these little lamps and they were there to light the path for the groom to come to the wedding. And he took a long time. I don't know, maybe he stopped to get some food and, you know, what the drive through wasn't fast enough or maybe they weren't close. I don't know why he took a long time. He never explained why he took a long time. You know what else? He never apologized for taking a long time. He took however long it was going to take. Why? Because... That's the representation of God. But these, these ten virgins, the problem is, is that five of them brought their lamp, and they only had enough oil in the lamp, and they brought no extra. And the groom took so long, how rude, they ran out of oil. And then when they heard the groom come in, they're like, oh my gosh, we're all out of oil. And they looked at the ones that had prepared for the longer ministry, and they say, give us some. And they're like, no, because we hear, but we don't see him yet. You're going to have to go out and find some more. And while they were out buying some more, the groom came. They came back, and the party door was locked. And when they knocked on the door, they got the same response. Go away. I don't know who you are. So if we're going to actually have living faith, then we are going to have to learn to focus our attention so that we can stretch. Oh, they're, they're tying together. There you go. So that we can stretch our preparedness. You know, I think some of us are um, getting way too ahead of ourselves, thinking, well, Jesus is going to be back shortly. Therefore, I can just put it in neutral and coast on to the finish line. You have no idea when Jesus is coming back. Nobody does. Nobody knows the hour or day. So if you put it in coast and neutral and you think you're close to the finish line just because of everything that's happening in the world, happening in the world, when you get home today, go read Matthew chapter 24 because Jesus said, don't be fooled by all that. You folks, stay focused, your attention, so you'll be prepared when I actually do come. Principle number two. You find this in the bags of gold. Focus your efforts so that you can stretch your profit. Now, I want to make sure you see that word profit is in quote because I am not talking about money. I am not talking about how we're supposed to be good stewards of our money and we're supposed to put money in the savings so that I can retire someday and set my house and do whatever it is that people do when they're retired. I have no idea at this point, okay? Um, but, but that's not the goal. What is profit for God? Hopefully you learned that from last week's sermon. What is profit for God? Fruit. Not leaves. Fruit. Okay, that's what profit is. And so we are supposed to focus our efforts so that we can stretch our profit. We know the story of the three bags of gold, right? The king, the, the master went away. He left his three servants in charge and he gave one guy five bags of gold, another guy three bags of gold, another guy one bag of gold. And he said, I'm going away for a while. You guys make me some money while I'm gone. And the guy that had the five bags went out and he worked hard and he invested. And he came back and the master came back. He said, here's your five bags and I gave you, I got five more. And the guy that had three bags, he, he took his three bags and he went out and he invested it in the kingdom. And he worked hard for the kingdom. And then the master came back and said, here's your three bags and I got three bags more for you. And the guy that got the one bag, well, obviously the master knew that he wasn't very good at what he did because he didn't entrust him with a lot. But he entrusted him with something, and he inspected him to do something with what he entrusted him with. And so when the master came back, the servant came to him and said, Well, I was really afraid that if I lost your one bag, that you'd do something terrible to me. But look, I went out and I dug a hole, and I put the things that you gave me in the hole, and I protected the hole so that nobody would steal it. And the master looked at him and said, You wicked, lazy servant. You should have at least taken the time to walk down to the bank and open up a savings account so we could draw interest. Who are you to put my gifts into a hole and expect you're just here to protect it? You're here to invest it, folks. And we need to remember this principle because this is one of those end-time parables that Jesus tells. And he says we have to focus our efforts, focus what we're doing on what will produce profit for the master. And then when we say profit for the master, it's not what I want to give him. It's what he wants me to give him. What does he want? Fruit. This ties right back. See how these three principles tie together? All four of them will tie together at the end. Because we have to do this. 
And if we don't, guess what? He called him a wicked, lazy servant. He was useless to the kingdom because he wasn't willing to focus and stretch. Now, what about this third one? Well, this third one, I think it is a doozy. You ready? Principle number three, sheep and goats. We have to focus on others so that we could stretch our ministry. You know this story too, I bet, right? I hope you do, because we've preached on this one a few times here. But the king comes back, and all the sheep and goats are, are gathered around him, and, and he looks at them, and he tells the sheep, you're good, and the goats, you're bad. And the goats are like, what did we do wrong? We were very good goats. Eh, we're good. What's wrong with us? And he said, well, here's the problem. You took no consideration of others. When you saw others that were in need, whether they were hungry or cold or sick or in prison or, or whatever their need was, you simply had no time for them. But sheep, you can come on in. Because sheep, when you saw those that were hungry and cold and in need and sick, you didn't have time for them either, but you made time for them. And I've got to tell you something. I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I just don't feel like I have enough time to do anything. And I'm guilty of this. But you do get it, right? Ministry is not about doing what makes me happy. It's about doing what will reach others. So that means I have to take into account what others need and sometimes I have to adjust, oh my gosh, the way I do church so I can reach a few others. Sometimes I have to adjust the way I live my life so that I can reach others. But you do see it begins with, I have to see them. If I don't focus on you, it, 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 how about I do it this way? I got a good way to solve my ministry problem. This is awesome. You know why? Because you're all one giant blur. I couldn't pick you out. I couldn't tell. If y'all moved around right now, I, I couldn't tell who's who. Because you know what? These glasses focus my attention, and this adds even more focus to it. And if we throw this away, and then we just try to stretch, then we stretch the wrong way. You see how these two pieces have to work together? If I fail to focus before I stretch, then I'm going to just be all over the place. And I'm going to look like one of those. You ever seen those things at the car lot when the wind is blowing? And it's kind of, that's how a lot of us are in our ministry. Whichever way the wind blows, that's the way my ministry goes. God says that's not the way this is supposed to work. This is why this foundation is so important. Because we're not going to get to heaven one day and say, God, I blew this way and I prophesied to some people. And God, I blew this way and I, and I, and I healed some people. And God, I blew this way and I, drew some, I, I, blew some, I drove some demons out. God, I blew all up. All, but you didn't have any focus in your life. And you never made a difference in anybody else's life because you never stretched into it. Go away from me, you evildoers, because I don't know who you are. That's a scary thought, isn't it? That's a hard thought. And that's not a thought that I really want to think about a whole bunch. But it's a thought that's important. See, because there is an alternate ending to this story. <coughs> Excuse me, too much flapping around. <coughs> Something went right down my throat. Excuse me just a minute, and I'll finish my sermon. <coughs> much better, maybe. Okay, so there's an alternate ending to this story if you choose to just do it your way. If you're going to be one of the, amongst the many, and just simply try to impress God, remember... The ten virgins, five were locked out. If you're going to try to do it your way and just try to impress God, remember, the bags of gold, one was deemed worthless. And well, the sheep and the goats, the goats were sent off to punishment. See, Jesus made no bones about it. Either you're going to focus and stretch, or you aren't going to be part of the kingdom. And that's hard. 
until you realize the kingdom has absolutely, positively nothing to do about a religion. The kingdom is all about the relationship. And when you focus and stretch toward Jesus and all of these things that he's talking about just happen because guess what? You're focused and stretched. So there's your question for today. Are you... Now, don't look at the person next to you. You can keep looking at the screen, or if you really want to be tortured, you can keep looking at me, whatever you want to do. Are you focused and stretched? Are you reaching outside of yourself to reach others for the kingdom of God? Have you put the magnifying glass in front of your eyes so that you can focus in on those that have needs and those that are hurting and those that are struggling? Or have you decided, you know what, I don't really have time for the magnifying glass. I've set it aside. I'm just kind of going through life. And God, you'll just like throw something in front of me when you really want me to. You'll, you'll give me a sign. You never want to ask God for a sign, just so you know that. Because God's signs are usually kind of really big because he really has to get the two by our four out and go pop to get your attention. Never ask God, give me a sign of what you want me to do next. He's already told you what, you, what he wants you to do. He wants you to establish your relationship with him. And then lead others to Christ. Simple formula. Now you do realize when you establish your relationship with him, you have to focus and stretch. You have to focus your attention on Jesus and stretch toward his forgiveness. Have you done that today? If you haven't, I'll be around. I'll be happy to sit and talk with you. If you're online, call the office, send an email, get in touch with me. We'll talk about what it means to make that kind of a focus and stretch. But if you've done that, and you've already done that, then i gotta, I got to ask you a question. Why did you stop focusing and stretching the moment you thought you were safe and going to heaven? Oh. You see, the focus and stretching just began because God is going to continue to say, see that need? See that one? See that one? See that? Stretch. Stretch. As many as you can, as many as you can reach, do it. What well, it costs a lot. Don't care. Do it. Well, I don't have to do it. But, no, just do it. Focus and stretch. Don't be amongst the many. Don't count on the fact that you're going to get to heaven someday and impress God with how nice of a person you are. Because here's the thing. God does know who you are. The question is, is do you know who he is?